it's often said when we look at, at, at climate change and particularly in the current language that there is no vaccine against climate change. There is no kind of magic solution to sort out this problem. And that is in, in many ways, it's true in that there isn't a single thing that is going to solve it. But I would argue that there is there are a couple of things which are basically joined and need to be put together. And those are human wisdom and ingenuity. There are so many solutions out there which are already being done, but need to be done much faster or need to be developed or need to be adopted, need to be backed by government, need to be invested in by companies, need to be voted for by people. But there are an awful lot out there and so many of them are in the land space. And I think there's a real massive opportunity, especially this year, to grab that. Now, this obviously is a narrative that LEAF has been on for quite a few years now, decades, certainly moving from the more broad environment space with uh, climate change coming more and more significant in their thinking in the last few years. So LEAF are perfectly placed to be one of the people who are leading this conversation. And if it's human ingenuity and wisdom you're after, we can't really uh, do better than the, the panel who's coming up with us today. And I will introduce them very shortly. But uh, just before we get into that, I want to talk a little bit about the housekeeping rules, just so we can get across uh, exactly what was going to be happening today. Now, the first thing I should mention is behind the scenes, there, I have a puppet master, Sam Conway, who's invisibly pulling my strings. And if I get something wrong, which is quite possible, he'll inevitably uh, to put me right. He's uh, Leafs marketing manager and is a very much the sort of structural brains behind today's conference. So thank you, Sam. So there are question opportunities here. You guys out there can ask questions. If you'd like to ask a question to a panel during the conference, click on the Q&A in the Slido app. That's the slido.com that you need to log on to, preferably on a different, uh, different device than that which you're actually involved in the conference with. And then the code for this conference is hashtag H973, hashtag H973. I think it's all in your joining instructions, but there you are anyway. Um, state your name and company when you submit a question. Also, if you click on the participants button within Zoom, I think this is a three dots should appear and you can raise your hand within Zoom. Um, Sam will look at some of those questions and try and curate some of those as well. But the primary way to ask questions is through Slido. They'll come to me, the most popular ones, or uh, similar ones will come to the top and I'll try and get those across. Uh, to our panel. Uh, the conference is uh, being recorded and will be shared on LEAF's uh, various platforms after the conference. And uh, if we have any uh, issues during the conference uh, with, uh, with um, technicals or you know, someone sort of hijacking the event or, or something like that, um, we, will of course, uh, we will of course let you know. Um, so, uh, Let's, uh, let me introduce the, the, the panel first of all, I'll just uh, quickly go around them. We have uh, Jonathan Wadsworth, who is joining us from the States and uh, hats off to him because it's only just gone five o'clock in the morning in Washington where he is. Uh, he is the climate change lead uh, for the World Bank. Uh, we have uh, Chris Buss, who is a forester by background, but he's leading the, uh, the charge on nature-based solutions in the upcoming COP26. He's charged with finding actions this year that are going to deliver that and presenting those to the conference. We have Minette Batters, who I think needs little introduction to this audience, president of the National Farmers Union, and uh, Duncan Farrington, uh, famous really for two things, his uh, mellow yellow brand of, uh, of uh, cold pressed rapeseed oil, and also being possibly the first uh, farmer, first business to be completely climate and uh, plastic neutral. So welcome to you all. Thanks very much for coming. Um, let's uh, crack on uh, with the conference. Oh, well, first of all, I'm just going to, before we go, just to get another uh, Slido question going on um, and check who's done their homework, who's actually looked at the videos that you were uh, all sent. Um, which of our two guests, which of the two guests I've just introduced, filmed their video outside. So let's just have a while you're having a think about that and uh, returning uh, the, the answers on that. Um, for those of you that don't know, or just to remind you, all of our guests uh, filmed some brilliant uh, videos. And I have to say, and I've been to quite a few conferences, as you'll be aware, and chaired quite a few. 
And these are some of the highest quality uh, films and the information within them is absolutely uh, fanta fantastic. So really well worth looking at. I'm not gonna scold you if you haven't looked at the films yet, have a look at them after the conference, but you're lucky because right now, the people who made them are gonna give you a little two minute summary of what they actually said. So time to hand over. Let's get going. Uh, Jonathan uh, Wadsworth from the World Bank, climate change lead from Washington. Take it away. All right, well, thank, thank you, Tom, and hello, everybody, uh, again. Uh, I, hope, I hope most of you were able to see the, the, uh, the video that I did. However, for those who didn't, or a quick, a quick refresher of, what, of the points I was trying to make, four quick points. Climate change action is really urgent and action is needed now. The window of opportunity for being able to, to maintain the climate at 1.5 degrees centigrade by the end of the century is closing fast. And many think that that's not even going to be possible now and we're looking more, more towards two degrees centigrade. And just one sort of quick fact, even if all the hydrocarbon emissions were halted right now and food and agriculture continues business as usual, that we would still get over 1.5 degrees. So agriculture and the food system is a key component. It's a, it's a key area for emissions control. Second point, that there are negative effects of climate change on agriculture and it's all around the world now being seen and the poor and vulnerable countries are always the hardest hit we risk losing decades of development progress if we can't control climate change. Third point, agriculture is a victim of climate change, but at the same time, it's a big culprit of climate change. And also simultaneously could be a, a massive solution to climate change, especially through carbon sequestration in soils, but in many other things that agriculture can do as well. And the very, very quick fourth point is that COP26 needs to be successful. We're sort of almost in the last chance saloon on climate change right now. COP26 must be successful. The Paris Agreement uh, ambition for climate change, we now know wasn't high enough. So COP26 needs to really up the game for everybody around the world and all the sectors which are involved. Uh, and food and agriculture needs to become central to controlling climate change. If that can come out of COP26, then we've got a, a good chance of moving forward successfully. But all eyes are on UK for leadership, political uh, leadership, uh, to get to COP26 uh, to that successful outcome. Thanks, Tom. Thank you very much, Jonathan. And, and next, uh, Chris Bass, who is from the International Union for the Conservation of Nature and also the co-lead on nature-based solutions at the upcoming COP26. Chris. Great, thanks, Tom, and, and, and thanks, Leaf UK, for, for allowing me the opportunity to be um, part of this panel, part of the conference. It's a really exciting opportunity. We were asked to give two minutes of our, of our summary of our slides, but actually I think the you look across uh, sorry of our videos but if you look across the four videos i think the message is clear across all four videos in the role that nature plays and nature-based solutions play in a solution to to help climate change but also the the other benefits that that nature can provide whether it be in water regulation bringing soil nutrients back into the farming system um, and and making sure that we see nature as a key component of farming systems. So really relying on nature, what we can bring into nature. It's not just the protection of nature, but it's also the use of nature in our farming systems. And I think that was what was exciting and rewarding to me is that was the message across across the four the four videos. Um, and 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 then more specifically in relation to climate change, the climate the, the carbon sequestration opportunities. I think Duncan outlaid that fantastically in relation to the opportunities of, of his of his farm and the the, the, the mini um, narrative that he was he was producing in the cars and, and and the emissions from car systems. I think it's it's a, it's a very powerful message, and also the role of farmers and the farmers as drivers um, drivers of drivers of change and an opportunity for change. 
Um, globally, we I do a lot of work on forest landscape restoration, focusing on the land restoration. 75% of the degraded lands is on the forest and farm interface on mosaic lands. And who manages that? Farmers manage that. So they are the key opportunity of drivers of change. And, and that's the exciting opportunity that we're here to discuss today, but also the opportunity as we lead into COP26 and, and beyond. Um, we mustn't just solely focus on one day, but let's go. What, what happens beyond is, is very exciting and the role of both nature and farmers in delivering those solutions. Chris, thank you very much indeed for that. And Manette Batters. Well, a very, very good morning, everyone. And what a huge privilege it is to be here at this amazing virtual LEAF conference. Um, look, the most extraordinary time at the moment. It's hard to believe that we are just over a month away from the ending of transition. We have no idea what the future relationship will look like, whether we leave with a deal or without a deal. And we should not underestimate the importance of leaving with a deal. Um, we laid down the gauntlet in, in 2019, and it was, I think, a very much a united industry approach that we want to see farmers as the solution, an ambition to beat the government target by 10 years. And with the right policy in place, with the right incentives, we think that 2040 is completely achievable to deliver carbon neutral food. Um, what I would say is that next year, 2021 is a big year for the UK, but it's a massive year for the world and the world's farmers. And I really passionately believe that the next decade is going to be the decade of the farmer. I, I'm part of the WFO, the World Farmers Organization. I was on a panel earlier in the week speaking with a Colombian farmer and a Jamaican farmer. And right across the world, there is this determination now that this is our time. The NFU has laid out, I, I feel, a, a really good starting ambition of where the policy needs to go with three fundamental pillars. And it is about locking down ever more carbon into our soils, looking at what we can do to achieve that. Yes, it's bigger hedges. Yes, it's more trees. Yes, it's agroforestry. Yes, it's beetle banks so many different things that we can do. But it's also about renewable energy, the bioeconomy, and in particular, climate smart farming, the opportunity to lead the world on what a sustainable food and farming scheme can look like that truly does deliver carbon neutral food. So this is our time. This is the opportunity that we choose to make it. And, and I really feel with all the challenges that we have in place, we have to look forwards and, and build a future that is built on, on evidence that allows us to really lead the changes that this world needs to see. I think that's been clearly uh, laid out by, by others and it'll be a great discussion today to look at how we continue to do that. Many thanks, Tom. Thank you so much, Minette. And uh, finally, in our panel, uh, Duncan Farrington, uh, North, um, excuse me, Northamptonshire-based arable farmer, and of course, a leaf demonstration farmer. Are you there, Duncan? Have you gone away? Let's see. Thank you. Sorry, Tom. Oh, you're thank back. you. Just, Excellent. Just yep. <laughs> So, yeah, thank you, Tom, and thank you, Leaf, for um, the opportunity. It's going to be another fantastic Leaf conference, I know, um, if not a bit different. Um, so I've been a Leaf farmer for over 25 years, and environment and sustainability is certainly at the heart of everything we do here on our farm. For example, I've been monitoring one field for over 18 years to get a picture of what that would do on soil health, even though at the start of this journey, I didn't really understand what I was doing. But in that time, I've shown that we've built up soil nutrition through our sustainable farming practices. And we've also increased the soil organic matter by a whopping 75%. And these are big figures. And if we can develop an internationally accepted and certified methodology, the benefits for climate change are absolutely immense. Now, I became uh, carbon neutral in, at the start of 2020, and I did this by initially taking all the data that I've done over the years for as part of our LEAF mark audits, and uh, then we worked on it and we got the certification. Now, I wanted to do this 
initially to show to myself um, whether it was possible or not, and it is. And then to show to others and people in the audience and farmers in the UK and around the world that it is possible, it is achievable, and it's achievable now. And I am absolutely convinced that if we go down this um, route, it will become a commercial success, not just a moral one, because society will increasingly demand and pay for it in the long term. So I see UK agriculture as benefiting from three income streams in various in varying degrees, no doubt, but we will continue to get income from the primary foods and produce we produce on our farms. We will get income um, from the public goods we'll produce through the environmental management schemes that will be paid by central government. And then I see the third one as an income from carbon trading, which will be paid by the private sector. There is a potential fourth area, and that would be in um, ecotourism, because individuals and uh, society will want to come and experience the su sustainable initiatives that we are looking at doing. So in summary, I don't think we should wait for us to start our sustainable journey, we, and not wait until we're pushed into it, but start it now and be ready to reward, um, reap the rewards later. And certainly by 2040, as an industry, as Min Minette has suggested, there's no reason why UK agriculture could not um, meet carbon neutrality, because the com at a commercial level, it will be a success. And more importantly, at a global climate change in level, we have to do it. Thank you very much indeed, Duncan. And uh, we're going to get into our discussion now. I'm going to pull some of them off uh, Slido here. Also, if members of the panel sort of want to uh, ask other members of the panel and get, get your hand up and we'll, uh, we'll sort that out. I'm going to start with you, Duncan, because you have in your films come out with the, the killer stat of, of all these films, which is that, um, and, and I'm going to check I've got this right, because it was, uh, it was an, an amazing thing to me, um, that you reckon that the work you're doing on the farm, the sequestration that you are accountable for now on your farm area is equivalent to 2,400 minis on the road so that every year your farm is emitting the same as 2,000 average 2,400 averagely driven minis um, I just want you to tell us how you work that out and how solid it is and it, it does kind of echo a question from Chris Newnham from Tiptree here who wants to know a little bit more about your carbon journey. So how did you work that out? How robust is it? Yeah, it's cer certainly, Tom. And I, I'm asked this question a lot, but I've taken one 20, 20 hectare field that we did the video in, and I've done um, in-depth soil analysis over time. And I think that's the important thing. That everyone's worried about a figure, but you'd need to look at it year after year. I've done the soil analysis. I'm not the scientist. Um, but we have shown that we have increased the soil organic matter by that 75%. We're on soil that can do it. So not every farm, I do accept that, will be able to do it to that level. And it won't necessarily continue forevermore. Um, but the soil, the, the, the carbon dioxide that that soil is absorbing is the equivalent to reducing or um, offsetting the um, emissions. I took a mini because that's a car we've got and we know what... Um, emissions they admit and we know you can look on public data on what the average UK driver drives per year um, and we've worked that out we've looked at our fertilizer use we've looked at our um, trees we've planted over the years the wildflower areas around the farm the electricity we use the the, the input that solar panels make on the roofs of our grain stores and the oil factory and you put it all together, and I, I actually came up with a figure, 2,438. Now, there is a lot of debate on just the actual analysis of soil carbon. And even if that figure is out by 500 cars a year, I just want to show to people, it's an easy thing that people can um, imagine. And even if I'm out by 500 cars, either way, it's, it's something we have to be doing. And, and whilst you know trees and solar panels and things like that are obvious, briefly, was it the soil, the absorption from the soil, in the short term at least, was the, was the big win here, was the really potent thing? Absolutely. So my figures, the, the, the trees around the farm, we've planted 8,000 over the years and we've got wild flower margins. They um, sequestered 240 tonnes and we're a, a 290 hectare farm. Mm. So the, the wildlife sequestered um, 240 tonnes 
whereas the soil sequestration on the cropped area of our farm was 3,780. So it, the, the, the actual farming and getting industry or no, getting, getting society to realise and farmers to realise what sustainable farming can achieve, it's, it's phenomenal, it's, it's huge. And Chris Bass, one of the points that uh, Duncan made in his film was a slight frustration in that at the moment, in the way that the, uh, the IPCC, uh, the, the UN uh, mechanisms that look at sort of accounting for climate change, they don't include absorption in soil at the moment. Is that right? Why is it? Why is it not being accounted for in our global metrics of this? Um, I, I can't speak to the exact question of why it's not accounted for, but I think as, as Duncan laid out, it, it is a massive opportunity that, that should be accounted for. I mean, it's absolutely and, and critical if nature-based solutions are going to take off as, as an exactly option. and and I, th I think that the the whole system um it's not just not just the soil but the whole farming system and how, how we include that is 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 critical to some of these calculations i think the uh i one of the things that has has come out of of my work that i'm working on in relation to my my job is i'm not, not related not employed by the uk government I'm working with the high level champions who support non-state actors in delivering climate action. And actually the, the, the soil carbon issue is coming to the forefront of those discussions. So this is the opportunity to say, highlight the value of soil carbon and highlight the actions that we need to do to restore the, the functionality and biodiversity in, 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 the, farm, in the farming soils. And it's, it's, it's a massive opportunity that, that is, is, is not, uh, not, not, supported with the investments that should be uh, supplied to, to really restore or capture carbon in the soil. Minna, uh, there's a question here from, from Susie Emmett, who talks about the frustration in trying to get a reliable carbon calculator for farms, and that this is a, something that uh, uh, they seem to be disappointed or they don't work or they don't fit the model. Can you, can you sort of guide farmers at all in this way, where to look for a good, uh, a good robust calculator? Well, cheekily, I'm going to signpost them to NFU Energy. Um, Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> to have a look to start off with. But look, this it, it is absolutely right what Susie says, because it's a competitive market and there is a lot on uh, a lot on offer at the moment, which is confusing. And we've got to get, I think it is essential that this doesn't actually become competitive. It could become competitive within retail. I did a great meeting with Morrisons yesterday who are very ambitious in this area. But we must, alongside what we did with antibiotic usage and responsible use of medicines, we must make sure that this has a whole approach right across the sector. And of course, it must be international as well. So the work of Mars Allen is absolutely key on this. And of course, he is the lead voice on the global stage. But the game changers, I think now, and what will drive the future thinking are China entering the race to net zero and Biden being elected president in the US. Those are massive helps that those countries will come in and support because this has to be an international focus, Tom, is really dangerous in many ways. If we just take the UK and operate in isolation, we've got to lead change and ultimately change at the WTO. Now that's the long game. But I'm hoping next year that the, the geopolitical situation on climate change will, will be very and, different to what it is now. And Minette, do you think farmers should be rewarded for increasing their soil carbon in the, the ELM scheme or other subsidies? Uh, look, I personally feel that you could deliver the whole of a future agricultural policy through the lens of achieving carbon neutral food. Because what we do know is this is a big focus on productivity. It's about producing more but on ever less ground with less inputs. Now that is good for the planet, that is good for the business, and that is good for the food that we are producing, biodiversity and environment as well. So it's, it's why we work so closely with LEAF and others to design a white paper proposal for government on what a sustainable food and farming scheme can look like, working on a points-based approach. So I am really hopeful that DEFRA are gonna pick this up and, and look at the entry point to ELMS as being about sustainable farming, which of course is where LEAF has been a, a pioneer in this area. I know there's, a, there's an issue here of whether you know, farmers end up lowering the carbon of their soil in order to then get the biggest prize for raising it. And you, people can end up uh, gaming the system a little bit with, uh, with those kind of rewards. But I, I wanna move on to soil now. Uh, Jonathan Wadsworth, you mentioned uh, carbon trading. 
in your film and that a price on carbon, I, I think uh, Chris or, or Duncan mentioned it as well, was going to be important. Are we really anywhere near getting a, a robust high price on carbon that people have to pay? Because like I said at the beginning, there is no vaccine against climate change. Actually, a lot of some people say a high price on carbon would be exactly that. So is it anywhere close, John? How long is a piece of string, basically? Uh, I don't know how close we are, but certainly there's a mount, uh, there's there's a there's a growing recognized recognition that uh, that the a robust carbon price is and a realistic carbon price is absolutely needed in order to incentivize all these uh, initiatives, not only in farming but uh, but in in other sectors uh, which are which are desperately needed. Uh, I, can, I couldn't give you a, a projection on, on when that's likely to happen. But, but you I think had some optimism be, in your, you said it was coming or something like that. You had a phrase that suggested you thought well, it was Yes, I, I, I remember saying that. I mean, I hope it, 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 I very much hope it gets into the conversation at COP26 and there can be some serious thinking done and, and, uh, and commitments made to move that forward quickly. Uh, I mean, there are, uh, in the United States, the, the you know people are putting a price on it. Some some companies, when they're investing in in carbon uh, in agriculture, are putting a ten dollars an acre uh, sort of so, uh, payment for farmers using certain practices. But just to come back on your one of your previous questions, one of the things that that is holding it back in 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 agriculture certainly uh, is a robust method of 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 assessment. A cheap enough method to be able to say maybe by remote sensing, for example, I think Duncan mentioned that, uh, of being able to, to to verify what carbon improvements have been made on farms, because really every farm is a, is is unique uh, in terms of uh, its potential and its ability to capture carbon. So sorry, I can't tell you when, but it needs to come quickly. Right, uh, I'm going to uh, come back to you with the one I know you're expecting. Um, livestock, beef in particular, you are a beef farmer. Uh, you said in your film uh, that we uh, shouldn't uh, be linking production of livestock with consumption. And Aaron Shackleton, who announces herself as 14 years old, says, why? Surely we should be making that link. We absolutely should not be making that link. And, and I'll, I'll briefly explain why, you know, all the calculations that we have worked on and everything that we are doing is, is being scientifically sense checked. We have a panel of scientists and academics who are, are looking at the policy that we are working up. Now, if you can get to uh, a climate smart cow, which we know is, is perfectly achievable and things like the work that is going on at Harper Adams, feeding microalgae, lowering um, feed proteins, um, same amount of yield of milk, but decreasing amounts of methane. We know that this is possible. We know with better genetics, with better health status, if you drive out endemic disease, you can retain the same number of livestock in this country with massively decreasing your food production footprint. So part of the, the carbon neutral ambition by 2040, it's perfectly possible to do it, but you've got to work on those three areas. You've got to look at feed additives, you've got to look at genetics, and you've got to look at health status. And you've got to reward and incentivize those to lead the change. Then if you take a global picture on all of that, of course, you can see a very different livestock sector across the world. But, you know, what we've got to remember here is we have a maritime climate. We grow grass. It is quite rare to have those, those green spots in the world where there is a moral imperative that we should be producing food. Now, there are many parts of the world where actually, you know, livestock are damaging to the planet. But here it is different and we grow grass, we have a predominantly extensive system. So what we are not consuming here, we should be able to export as an added value market opportunity to other parts of the world where they don't have access to those same things and exactly the same for dairy, Tom, as well. Um, Minette, given your concerns about climate change, while we wait for the climate smart cow, should we be eating less meat? Um, I get frustrated about the less but better. I think our diets on the whole are pretty shocking, if I'm honest. You know, we want to get back to whole foods. We want to get yeah, back. You haven't answered the question. Should we be eating less meat while we wait for climate smart cow? 
depends where you start, doesn't it? You know, it, <laughs> I would say we should be eating less processed food and that would be actually much better for the planet. So if you're eating whole meat and you're not eating massively processed food, having meat every day as part of a healthy balanced diet is really, really good for you. Filling your plate with highly processed food full of meat, of okay. course, isn't quite so good for you. We've got a lot of people who are concerned about climate change on this panel. Can I just put that question to all of you? Uh, Jonathan Bosworth, should we be eating uh, less meat at the moment? Simple answer. Jonathan? Yes. Yes. Uh, Chris? Well, I'm, I'm sat here in, in the Charolais region in France. Um, so um, Name of a cow. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's just sat outside my window, so I would be, I would really sit on the it's the it's the production systems that we've got to focus on, and making sure that the, the, the that those are sustainable. And there's other people. If you mix up these these things, as as Minette says, you, there's a lot of confusion. But focus so on you're, yeah, population you're growth on is one of the questions. The so building region, that up. <laughs> uh, Duncan, let's meet while we wait for the the climate smart camp. I I would go with the less. Um, but better quality and and yeah Britain is a prime livestock producing country of um, superb quality and climate efficiently and also sub-Saharan Africa um, we need to um, allow people to get back to their natural herding instincts because they too can produce livestock as a valuable source of protein and lower uh, uh, the temperature of the climate if they do it and reduce desertification which I know is controversial but it seems to be proven. Chris Bass, I want to come on to a question that we touched on before, but it's been amplified by, by one of the delegates here, and I think it is key. You're, you're, you believe, and you said at the end of your, your film, that you know, nature-based solutions will be the, the key here. Um, in incentivizing those, is it right that we only reward land managers for changing what they're doing, because this markedly disadvantages land managers who are already doing the right thing. How do we resolve that, Chris? Well, I, I think it's, it's I, I think there's, there's, there's two parts to that. The, the first part is, is how, do we, how do we see nature and how do we see the role of nature-based solutions? Um, and too often we see nature from a, a protection mechanism and, and that we're protecting, we're protecting nature. Um, which is which is fine on the one hand, but on the an other opportunity is the role that nature plays in the, in the services that it provides to to, to farms. Um, so we have to see it from from that perspective that actually it should have a key business component in in the farming systems rather than as an add on of of um, of corporate social responsibility for want of a better phrase. So going back to then more directly to your question, I think then is is how do we is is if you're still doing the right thing it's it's a transformation and the uk government are looking at how they can change the perverse incentives to actually better incentives for better land use land use systems and and that should benefit all all farming systems that are that are working on better land management practices including those those that are doing the right thing at the right time so it shouldn't be an incentive just for change, but incentive to continue doing the right thing and making sure that, that, that good land management practices are integrated into, into uh, agricultural farming systems. And what role will, will trees in all their various different forms have in this? Um, you know, in the past, we've kind of seen them slightly, you know, very separate, you know, farming, forestry, two different skills. Um, and indeed, the way that the the cap incentivized people to, get, to kind of get rid of trees, you know, very much drove that. But what role do you see in the future for, for mixing uh, trees and crops and trees and cows? Indeed? Yeah, I, I, I come from a for, forestry trained background um, and um, it, we've it, globally, we work with a lot of um, farmer organizations, but five or six years ago, we were working with a lot of forestry organizations. <laughs> And particularly community forestry groups around the around the globe, in both both Europe, Africa, Latin America, Asia, and what was really interesting is as as some of our work has evolved, where we've got the biggest traction has been with farmer organisations, and the farmer organisations using trees in their farming systems. So, and that that to me has been a massive. Uh, is a massive learning point that it's the farmers they're managing the land. So, why do they want to put trees into their farms? Um, and 
obviously the, the, the direct benefit in, in when we're talking about climate change is the, is the climate sequestration, but it comes with another of a full range of then a full range of other benefits, whether it be water regulation, um, whether it be whether it be just um, supplying supplying firewood. I mean, sitting here where I am now, we had a big storm and everyone's that's it. It's their heating done for the rest of the year. They're off clearing out their farms. And, and of course, in Africa, that's a completely different different uh, different mindset. In in Africa, you could say that that forests provide sixty to seventy percent of some rural rural communities who are in poverty as part of their livelihood strategies. You come into Europe, it's not, not as extreme as that, but it is critical to both ecosystem functionality, but also livelihood um, livelihood benefits as well. So, so it's understanding that suite of services that those that trees can provide. Minette, are we seeing farmers becoming a, a little bit more tree friendly? Is there a bit of a, a gradual sea change happening there? <laughs> I think farmers are quite frustrated and that they always have been in their eyes tree friendly. Um, you know, I don't I don't know why you shake your head. I love trees. <laughs> yeah, famously, <laughs> they, they, you know, the trees often I, disappear from the middle. Of, and I'm not really blaming them because they, they weren't they weren't they being incentivized. Don't, they to be don't disappear from the middle of a field. You're you're sort of going back <laughs> decades and farmers follow policy. That's the point. Yeah. You know, farmers follow the policy. Everybody yep. sort of thinks that farmers are there sort of dreaming up these things. They follow the policy of the day and, and policy has indeed changed and policy is now going toward more towards tree planting and the opportunities around agroforestry, around tree planting in general um, are enormous. But I think it's, it's got we've got to keep remembering that these are businesses, you know, farmers run businesses, the more they can have profitable, thriving businesses, the more they can invest in other things, the more they can make space for nature. I guess my frustration is that it's very easy for things to just be about trees. Trees is the easy bit. Let's focus on everything else as well, because if we get everything else right, tree planting becomes a natural outcome of a thriving, profitable, sustainable business. Just while we've got a little uh, moment here in the midst of this conversation, I'm gonna launch another Slido question here. Um, so on a scale of one to 10, how optimistic are you that we as an agricultural industry can reduce our carbon footprint by half in 10 years. So not just can we do it, can we do it by half in 10 years? And we'll, we'll bring up the answer a little bit later, give you some time to, uh, to think about that one. In the meantime, Jonathan, I'm just gonna come to a question for you, which isn't, isn't particularly farming, but is very much climate change, often gets raised in these circles. And I know that the World Bank has interest in this area, which is about population, as there are more and more of us to, to, to feed and indeed more and more of us emitting um, uh, emitting carbon, you know, needing a, a good lifestyle. Uh, is this a problem? Is, is this something which is being addressed or is it kind of the elephant in the room that is always forgotten? Uh, you're referring to population. In, yeah. Uh, world population. Well, uh, it's it's not an elephant in the, in the room. I mean, it's something which is taken very seriously, actually, and, and people people project a lot of things based on population. But one of the one of the sort of what one of the issues in, in development is that as e, as economies develop and as people's livelihoods improve, what tends to happen is that the is that the population increase tends to decline. Uh, people people, are, you know, I mean, there's very strong relationship, relationships between the the amount of education especially that well particularly of young girls yep. young women uh, how long they stay in education and the sorts of, of future careers and livelihoods that they they've got uh, related to the number of children they eventually have both the age at which they they get married and, and and start to have families and how many children they actually have so there's a there's if you like there's a sort of a self-compensating mechanism families decline in size as people become more prosperous and have better livelihoods and better life chances. And I know this investing in female education is something that the World Bank's particularly involved in, isn't it? There's a lot of money going out to, to, to schemes that are promoting that in, uh, in, in poorer countries. Yeah, absolutely. That's, uh, that is very much the case. You know, the, the, the SDG targets on, on universal education for everybody, especially especially uh, young women and girls and young women, to, to get to absolute equality on that. And, and so far, you know, the world isn't there yet in many, in many places. 
And one of the other issues I know that you, you feel strongly about that is very much connected to food, if not necessarily directly to farming and climate change, is food waste. You know, what, 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 is, the, what is the picture here and how can we help to tackle that? Because I think people say if, if food waste was a country in terms of its climate carbon emissions, it's, it's third only to America and China. Well, that's absolutely true. I mean, food waste, and of course, in the developing world, food loss is more of an issue, i.e. At the, at the production side and the, the production chain side before it gets to, you know, people don't tend to throw much food away, consumers in, in developing countries. They tend to use it all themselves. Uh, whereas in developed countries, more richer countries, uh, the majority of the, of the waste is at the consumer level. You know, how many times do people on this call, you, know, you find something that's gone, it's gone past, its, past its date in the fridge and it goes straight into the bin. Uh, so there's a, about a third of, of food and agriculture emissions are accounted for in, in the waste. So imagine farmers have gone to all the trouble of producing that, people have shipped it around the world, people have processed it, and a third of it then goes into landfill and creates more methane and more emissions. So this is a, there's a huge issue there of policy, of education, of, of consciousness of, of consumers. Consumers are the biggest force in my, in my mind of, of making inroads on climate change and transformation in the food and agriculture system. Because not everybody is a farmer, but everybody is a consumer. And every time you, you take a meal or you, or you make a, a, a choice of what you're going to buy and consume, you can affect transformation in the food and agriculture system. So I do feel strongly on this. Well, can I, Tom, can I just yeah, jump, jump in on that? I think it, it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting, interesting point, but I think with the food system, we have also have to be very careful of trying to, that we, you know, perhaps the farmers, uh, are, are too much pressure on them to, to fix everything. So you have to really think about your entry point. And the entry point here is looking at the farm, farming system. And on the farming system and in relation to population, it's, it's, it's how can we incre increase production on the, on the farms? You know, whether, whether you're going to get you know, population growth, you're still going to get moved from a population from, from poverty into, into more prosperous economies that therefore have much more choice. So, so what can we do about it on, on managing those land systems is put in systems in place that are much more sustainable, much more focused to, to enable us to to have much more productive land systems to, to uh, help address those challenges and increasing yields on the land that we have at the moment. And just in terms of, of what people can do, because um, Jonathan mentioned that everyone's a, a, a consumer here. Um, uh, Tony Powell asks, um, should the term carbon neutral be something that retailers put on their food packaging and could be robustly trusted? I mean. Duncan, you claim to you say you are carbon neutral. Is that something you'd like to see, you know, bold on the packaging and and acknowledged and rewarded? Yeah. So at the moment, um, retailers are very uh, happy to hear about our carbon neutral and also our plastic neutral story. Um, we we aren't paid anything extra for it. However, um, one of our uh, big customers, uh, one of the, the the major retailers, have stated that they want. To all their suppliers to be um, supplying them carbon neutral food. I can't remember the target, but certainly in the next, I don't know, 10 or 20 years. So it is it's coming. And, uh, and just on, on the food waste bit, we've got to be very careful. Um, we don't just look at it as a middle class, middle income sort of country. It is um, what, what we, we all tend to do here is um, we, it's by leading by example, I, I'm, I'm finding that um, it nudges other people and our customers and consumers in the right direction as well. Yeah, I, I sometimes have a, uh, forgive me, it's the journalist in me, I have a, a whiff of cynicism when it comes to farmers talking about food waste, at least domestic food waste, because in some ways it, it's quite good for them, <laughs> quite good for you, because you're going to be selling it anyway if it, if it ends up being, being thrown away. So if we waste Half, you know, we waste half as much, you sell half as much, you see, if you sell, no, that doesn't quite work out. But you see what I'm saying? Is, is there a really incentive for farmers to cut down on food waste generally? Duncan first, just out of it. So, yeah, well, after, after the harvest I've just had this year, um, I, I wish I'd got a lot more grain in the barn. So, <laughs> yeah, 
uh, the realities may be a bit different, but no, I, I see exactly where you're coming from, but I don't, I don't think that's, that's the case. But yeah, I, I can see the argument. I, I don't agree with it. And Minette, are you, uh, can you convince me that farmers are really passionate about reducing food waste everywhere in the food chain? They are, Tom, and I'll tell you why. Because, you know, food waste is, is the outcome of not valuing food. And actually, if we all valued the food that we eat and, and had a better understanding and had it, you know, we believe very strongly that agriculture should be part of STEM learning. Um, and if you value your food, ultimately, you won't waste it. And to be wasting, as we are in this country, 16 billion pounds worth of food is, is a disastrous situation. It's disastrous for the planet. It's disastrous for people. And it just shows what a cheap food policy has has delivered so i think every farmer in this country stands solidly behind the fact that you know our attitude to food needs to change and we need to value our food and our food system more that will then deliver the changes that are needed just very briefly tom you know there is going to be a cost to uh, delivering carbon neutral you know if i look at our poultry producers 16 percent of costs are laws laws in this country that they have to abide by and this is the big ticket item with trade going forwards. You know, regulation costs money. So it's really important that the new public monies for public goods is able to invest in this area to incentivize the change and to pay for the things to Duncan's point that he is not getting paid for at the moment. We cannot keep having better and better behind the farm gate and expect to stay where we are at the moment with you know one of the most affordable food systems in the world. It has to be about public monies for public goods and what better cause than delivering on carbon neutrality. Well, Minette, you raise an absolutely fascinating point. And I, I, I often think, you know, farming and food is so often asked to do all these things, you know, look after nature, look after the welfare of workers, quite rightly, uh, look after carbon, look after yeah. water and so on. And yet we want to pay less and less for it. So let, let once again, just go around the go around the, the, the panel here. Is it possible, uh, Jonathan Wadsworth, to deliver farming that is not a, that is part of the climate solution, that is actually absorbing carbon and keeping us fed whilst keeping rock bottom prices? Jonathan? Well, there's an awful amount, there's an awful lot of, of green investment funds out there ready to be placed in the market for investment in, in, uh, in nature-based and climate smart solutions to, to climate change. In other words, there's a lot of, the, the investors are ready to, to invest in payment for environmental services when there's a carbon price, because they can offset that. I mean, there are all these financial mechanisms whereby this becomes a smart investment. It's like a good business proposition. So I think to answer your point is, if farmers can, can recoup part of the cost of their climate smart practices in order to maintain food prices low through being carbon farmers as well as food farmers at the same time. I think Duncan alluded to this earlier uh, in, in one of the things that he said. So there, I think there are ways of, of doing that. I mean, don't forget the food and agriculture system has basically kept prices low all, all around the world for a long time. I mean, well, quite, some, but at, at, some, places, at some would argue a considerable cost to the planet to deliver that. Exactly. So, and that's that. Then you know starts to become a, um, it's a it's a it's a it's a public issue then. But certainly, I don't think we would want to limit people's access to food, especially in those countries that are struggling to for good nutrition okay. anyway. So these are you know these are these are serious political. Uh, and development issues around the world. Chris Buss, do you think we can have climate smart food? Can we have climate smart food and cheap food simultaneously? I, I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a necessity. I don't know the economics of, of the- Sorry, which leaving, is a necessity? Leave, 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 leaving the farm, farm gate. But I think, I think you do raise an important question around the public goods and the role of public finance in the whole and the, the, the correct targeting of that. And I think there's always a standoff between at the farm gate um, and even inside the farm gate, what public funding's what public funding is for and how it can support um, improved systems for for public for public goods. And uh, is there is there an argument? I think that the carbon discussion is really interesting, and it's it's important that you have a good 
buyer and a good seller at the top or a good user and a good producer. Um, and that, you know, sometimes that, that production system in for carbon, if you look at it from a carbon point of view, is, is, to, is for global good as well. And so, you know, we have to make sure that public financing is well, well targeted, which potentially then will help keep the, the food prices down. Um, let's have a look if we can at the result of that uh, Slido poll. Is that something you can bring up for me, Sam? I, don't, I can't find it by clicking on. So this was the, the Slido poll of on a scale of one to 10, how optimistic are you that we can, we the agriculture industry can reduce our carbon footprint by half in 10 years time. Um, so on our scale of one to 10, I didn't, with presumably 10 being highly optimistic and one being not, not optimistic at all. I never actually said which way around the scale was, but I'm assuming uh, 10 is for the optimists and one is for the pessimists. Um, so, uh, uh, the, yeah, I'd say that, that, that there's, a, there's a definite bias towards the optimistic end of the, um, of the spectrum. I just need to slightly change something on my screen to see if anyone, how many people are on 10. Oh, well, there's 7% on 10 and only 1% on one. So that's very good. And the, uh, the median uh, score is, is, is seven. So there is definitely optimism out there, which is tremendously encouraging, uh, really. I'm, I'm very, very pleased by that to see that people have that, that level of optimism out there. Um, I've just got to click on my screen to get it back to the right place, please excuse me. There we go. Um, so yeah, if we can, uh, that, that's great. If we can take that, that Slido poll off the, sh the shared screen now, that would be, uh, that would be absolutely uh, brilliant. Um, uh, I, I just want to, we've, we talked a little bit about at the start about how you can sequester carbon in arable fields. Uh, Minette, I just wanted to uh, give you a chance to say, to talk about how carbon can be sequestered in pasture and how well that is done. It's a question that, that someone, uh, how widely I should say that is done. It's a question that someone's put here. Forgive me, I've, I've lost the name, but that, but that was the drift of it. In the livestock system, you're talking about. Yeah, in livestock, in yeah. pasture, whether it be sheep or cattle or whatever. So I think, you know, we already are, you know, livestock farms already are locking down huge amounts of, of uh, carbon because you've got a lot of, of permanent pasture. But I think the, the game changers are... Sorry, for the people who don't know, can you just explain how that happens in a permanent pasture? What's, what's the system that gets... The well, down ultimately, you're, you're not, you know, you're not moving the soil at all. So you are just keeping it embedded in a, in a permanent pasture situation. I mean, I farm on the Wiltshire, Hampshire, Avon. We've got uh, iconic water meadows that are, uh, the river is um, is triple SI and the water meadows are as well. They've never, ever been touched. And, and obviously, we've got a lot of that across the country. But we've also got to look to the new opportunities and what we have been focusing on here is really investing in, in our grass, uh, putting in herbal lays, putting in clover so that we are locking in nitrogen and we are then using less synthetic fertilizer. And, and these are the changes that, that are so great, Tom, because that is good for the business because you know the, the cost of our inputs at the moment is continually skyrocketing. So the more you can take those costs out and invest in your grassland, the more carbon you can lock down in your soils, and, and you are then decreasing your food production footprint because you are using less inputs. And, and those are the changes we've got to make. And I, I do think, you know, I'm loath to criticize the past, but if we get this right going forwards, you know, we are going to get back to proper sustainable farming, getting back into rotations, hopefully getting more livestock as part of rotation. And my big frustration with the sort of anti-meat and plant-based is that you know it is the livestock that puts the biodiversity back into the soil you know that allows us to set step back from synthetic use and and that's what we've got to get back to we've got to get back to soil health rather than just focusing on on entitlements to uh, a certain extent and I, I think it's it is a massive opportunity but there are you know, we sit here today, first agricultural bill in 70 years. They don't come along every day of the week. And when I think only two years ago, what the agricultural bill looked like, didn't mention agriculture, didn't mention food production, it now does. But we've now got to deliver this and really work as a united industry as to what the future should look like. Because, you know, Elms originally, I felt very much, this is sort of stewardship on steroids. It is hedges, it is trees. We've got to focus into the core business on a whole farm approach. And that 
that has to happen. Otherwise, I think, you know, we are into then a very different time with a step back from active pharma, access to all. You know, I'm focused on the long game of making sure that this policy is going to stack up for the term of the next parliament, the next parliament. And we really do get to a place 2040, 2050, where we have transformed what we are doing here. And we are leading the world in that area. Um, just a, a final thought from you, uh, Duncan, and forgive me, this is a little bit of a technical question again, but it is something that a couple of people have asked me. I, I was talking to people about your, your video and saying uh, how great I thought it was. And they actually came back to me and said, actually, how, when you're taking a crop off the field, do you simultaneously improve the carbon of the soil beneath? Can you just give me a minute on that? Yeah, just so I haven't ploughed any of our land since 1998. And as Minette says, you know, if it's permanent partial, you wouldn't disturb it. So the plants photosynthesize the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and they pump it down through the systems in the roots and into carbon or carbohydrate into the soil. Now, every time you move that soil, it exposes it to an oxygen rich um, environment and it releases back again CO2. So when we remove, you know, if we're growing wheat or rapeseed, um, a third of the biomass may be roots, a third of the biomass may be straw, and a third of the biomass may be the seeds that we're harvesting. So in any one year, you're growing a whole plant, an annual crop, and you're only removing 30% of it because the straw I chop behind the combine and it composts down and the worms and the beetles and everything else take it in. Um, we have, I don't have livestock, and I'd love to have some livestock, um, to put some good manure back in, but we have um, on rotation, we use sewage sludge, which used to go out as a waste product in the North Sea, but we put that on the ground um, following soil analysis to put phosphate and body and organic matter into the soil. And then also by uh, widening our crop rotation, including more spring crops, um, I'm doing a lot of um, cover and uh, cropping through the winter, which are growing, whether it's legumes or um, other species to put again it's more it's pumping that um, photosynthetic driven co2 pump um, or carbon pump into the soil so we're doing lots of different things but none none of it is rocket science it's just trying to to do all the little nudges and trying to get it right and i don't always get it right i must say that but it worked on, on the whole it, it has worked and you know the figures prove it <laughs> there's a great admission of that in your video and i do uh, uh really repeat if anyone hasn't seen the videos of our of our four contributors here you really should because there's some real uh, detail information things to take away there and also some confessions uh, notably from Duncan that his uh, uh, use of a cover crop was quote a complete disaster <laughs> so the, there's honesty there not just PR from the from the, 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 the delegates here so yeah uh, my, my, my agronomist was absolutely disappointed it is eight the difference between disaster and success was eight days uh, planting and it, it if I'd have planted it eight days earlier it would have got the rain and it'd be it'd be a fantastic story so I haven't got a good story there at the moment but you know we learn from it don't we yeah but I also actually love that thing that you just told me is that I mean, I know it varies plant to plant, but for, for most crops, you're only taking a proportion, maybe a third away. And if you leave that other two thirds of, of, uh, of, of material, of photosynthesized trapped carbon on the land, it's likely some of it will get bound into the soil. That's really useful to know. That's absolutely great. Now then, um, the, the, the delegates are staying with us, but we're gonna move on to a different part of the uh, conference now. And just before I do that, I'm gonna launch another little Slido question here for everybody, uh, which is, if you could name one issue that you want COP26, and that, that's the uh, International Climate Change uh, meeting that's happening in Glasgow about a year from now. If you wanted one issue that they should tackle, what would it be? So what should be the, the thing for you that the issue you really want to, the next big international climate change meeting? More than 100 leaders expected in Glasgow. What should they be focusing? Well, that's uh, the end of our group discussion. As I say, so the delegates will be staying with us, but we're moving on. Thank you very much for now, uh, to, for, for all four of you. That was uh, absolutely uh, fantastic. We're going to come on now to the, the sort of more leaf-focused uh, part of the day and uh, the, featuring a new uh, strategy launch uh, from LEAF. And this is going to be kicked off before we hear from uh, a couple of uh, LEAF's uh, famous names. Uh, we're going to have a, a video, first of all, outlining the strategy, and I think you'll guess the narrator.
Thank you very much. Let's have the video. Our planet is under pressure. Climate change is accelerating. And for farming, random and extreme weather events are creating conditions that are too wet or too dry, resulting in increasingly inconsistent harvests and outbreaks of pests and diseases. Nature is in danger, with a growing number of plants, pollinators, wildlife and insects becoming threatened, often due to loss of habitats. Our food system needs to be radically transformed. This is farming's moment. Many of the challenges we face today can be solved through our capability to transform farming and food systems. What an opportunity. For more than three decades, LEAF, linking environment and farming, our farmers and members have been committed to driving change and delivering more sustainable farming through the adoption of integrated farm management. We have achieved so much. This is our next chapter setting out the LEAF strategic plan over the next 10 years with three core themes, health, diversity and enrichment. We are proud of those farmers and the businesses we work with across the farming, food, environment and research sectors. They are all defined by a can-do approach, motivated to create systems change, shifting sustainability to new heights. It is an amazing story of thousands of farmers and others in the industry in the UK and across the globe. We're a force for good, driven by a mission to do things differently, better and smarter, creating solutions to catalyze change and building on the successes of what we have achieved so far. Our next focus is about transforming farming and food systems. For LEAF, this is about delivering and promoting climate positive action thriving, resilient and exemplar agroecological farming and scaling this up in new sectors and at a global level. Working with farmers, the food industry, scientists, environmentalists, advisors and consultants, teachers, young people and consumers, we are looking at new ways to deliver productivity and prosperity amongst our farmers, enrich the environment and engage young people and wider society in a valuable and meaningful way, sharing ideas and solutions as well as creating new alliances. We will build on our practical and forward-looking approach, our LEAF demonstration network, our management tools, training and events, the LEAF Mark eco-labelling certification programme for environmentally sustainable food, our LEAF education activities and engaging society such as through LEAF Open Farm Sunday. We have updated our vision and mission, defined our ambitions and set out our commitments to meet our 2031 targets. Our vision is a global farming and food system that delivers climate positive action, builds resilience and supports the health, diversity and enrichment of our food, farms, the environment and society. Our mission is to inspire and enable more circular approaches to farming and food systems through integrated, regenerative and vibrant nature-based solutions that deliver productivity and prosperity amongst farmers, enriches the environment and positively engages young people and wider society. Our strategy sets out LEAF's ambition to deliver game-changing benefits to farmers, our members, society and the environment. How we can play a demonstrable part in transforming farming and food systems to drive positive action for climate, nature, the economy and society. Embracing circular agriculture with health, diversity and enrichment at the centre of all we do. Through our work we will support and will contribute to the practical delivery of national and global commitments. This will include the Sustainable Development Goals, the Paris Agreement and the post-2020 Biodiversity Framework. Working through our three core work streams of knowledge generation and exchange, market opportunity and education and engaging society, our 10-year strategy will support eight cross-cutting commitments, delivering climate-positive solutions creating beacons of excellence, 
measuring impact and harmonizing metrics, building sustainable food chains, growing education and engaging society, cultivating sustainable health and well-being, building connections and scaling up our reach. We look forward to you joining us on the journey to deliver meaningful and scalable change for our farming and food sector, to support the health of our planet and people, build diversity in our environment and food systems, and enrich our lands and mines. Thank you for your support. That was great. And I just got to uh, amplify a comment made here from a Mr. Cedric Porter, who says, Caroline should do an M&S ad. This is not just farming, this is leaf farming. Anyway, over to uh, Leaf Chief Executive Caroline Drummond and uh, Leaf Chair Philip Wynn for the 10-year strategy. <clears throat> Firstly, what I, what I want to say is how delighted I am to see so many people join us for our annual conference today. And thank you, Tom, for steering us through this uh, really important subject that uh, in, going to impact us all in the years ahead. Great contributions from our panel, great videos. And if you haven't seen them, as Tom said, do go back and look at them. They were really well worth uh, looking at, really thought provoking. Now I've said on many occasions how proud I am to be chairman of LEAF, because this is an organization that's led, driven and led massive change uh, over the last 30 years through the uh, creation and development of integrated farm management. But I'm equally proud of all those work that the farmers do in our demonstration farms. It's their no nonsense approach, their continual resourcefulness to raise their game, the challenging the status quo, and they've delivered some quite remarkable achievements in sustainable food production. At last year's conference, you may recall that I introduced our new strategic plan. I gave you a few soundbites of what we thought it might look like. But as importantly, I ask for your help in mapping out the future of, all, of our organization. So our new strategy is a result of engagement at all levels, testing our ideas to create a new vision and mission, which Caroline has just outlined. Now, today's conference, to me, has highlighted some of the challenges ahead of us all. And LEAF has a really vital role to play in driving change and climate positive actions, as many of our panel have already commented. And we as an organization have come a very long way since David Richardson first championed the organization and Caroline became its leader and ambassador. But in reality, ladies and gentlemen, our journey has only just started. Our new 10 year plan uh, for the organization is both bold and ambitious. Yes, it is an advancement of our work in developing and promoting more sustainable agriculture, but it is the principle of circular agriculture that will support the delivery of positive action for climate, nature, economy, and society. And yes, it will mean an update to our famous IFM wheel, which I see at the top left-hand corner of my screen uh, in the years ahead. But as Caroline has just outlined, we will deliver against eight commitments through our three existing key pillars of work. And as you know, these are really deeply embedded in the LEAF structure, knowledge exchange and, and generation. And with our LEAF demonstration farms, innovation centers, enabling smarter, wiser, and more sustainable farming. Growing market opportunities through LEAF Mark certification. And of course, education and public engagement through LEAF education. Our new themes for the future are firstly health, and we mean this in all respects. It's health of our farmers, their livestock, their crops, the industry, the environment, and of course, the well-being of society as a whole. And then secondly, diversity, diversity of land use, development of circular farming systems, increasing biodiversity, 
and of course, understanding the barriers for engaging with society. And the third theme is enrichment, enrichment of our soils through regenerative, regenerative and resilient farming, protecting habitats, feeding the minds of young people and driving their ambitions, all part of that subject. Now, Caroline's made comments to, to eight commitments that we make within our new strategy. And these are directly aimed at transforming our food and farming systems. And they're fundamental to our ability to scale up change through deeper and extended partnerships and business models, not just here in the UK, but across the globe. And today with the time I have, I can only touch on three of these. So I'm going to talk about creating beacons of excellence, first of all. And that is really about strengthening our network of demonstration farms and innovation centers, because that will enable us to scale up our capability and expand our reach. And we know from experience that working with others to experiment and adapt will deliver measurable change. But measuring and quantifying results will be the fundament will be fundamental for success. So we want to see many more farmers like Duncan leading change on carbon, plastic, biosecurity, and the development of circular farming systems, reducing waste, developing byproducts that can benefit society and reduce the proliferation of harmful products. They will be our ambassadors for the development of even smarter, intelligent, farming for the future. Secondly is our commitment to build more sustainable and adaptable food chain. And we want to strengthen the opportunities for reward through LeafMart certification and build its share of the market through even greater recognition of the values that this standard supports. Today, 43% of the fruit and vegetables that are purchased and consumed in the UK are LeafMart certified. Now our ambition is to increase this by as much as 30% in the next 10 years, with consumers making more informed choices across a much wider range of products. And lastly is our commitment to grow education and engaging society. This year, despite all the restrictions that we've had on our daily lives through the pandemic, LEAF Education has worked with nearly 11,000 young people and connecting with 1,400 teachers. Farmer time has now reached 600 pairings, connecting with uh, 18,000 children. And our engagement through Countryside Classroom has now been increased this year by 77%. And while Leaf Open Farm Sunday had to go online this year, we supported 29 live virtual farm tours, not just here in the UK, one in Africa and one in Spain as well. And that, uh, that, that actually led to 280,000 views of these videos and 1.7 million social media impressions. It's fantastic. Without any doubt, I think LEAF leads the field in the area of public engagement. We have events for farmers, we have events for children, members of the public, parents, teachers. Uh, the feedback we get is simply fantastic. But ladies and gentlemen, this is not enough. And we'll need to do more in the next 10 years to embed knowledge, understanding, appreciation of farming, food and the environment in deeper into everyday life. So our ambition includes 50 leaf demonstration schools, a thousand farmer time long-term partnerships, and getting 2 million people each year to connect through leaf to either an on-farm or virtual farm experience. So I hope this gives you a flavor of the future of leaf's work. And I'm sure Caroline will add a few more comments uh, shortly. But I just want to end by thanking our team, uh, our members, our ambassadors, our supporters for getting LEAF to where it is today. Our journey ahead now 
is indeed ambitious. It needs to be ambitious, but it's also exciting and inspiring. And I absolutely know that working together, we will continue to deliver meaningful change within, within the food and farming sector. And as Caroline has said, support the future health of our planet and our people. Thank you. And now I'll hand over to Caroline. Thank you very much indeed, Philip. And again, I mean, I would just very much like to reiterate, you know, this is an, a very exciting time. Farmers hold the opportunity for being in control to so many of the solutions to the big, big challenges that have been highlighted this morning. And I think from our perspective, we know that we can play a part. We have some of the most exemplar driven can-do farmers a fantastic leaf team uh, and it's great to see many of those around the, the table today including uh, many of our regional education consultants as well and of course the industry our members and us and our stakeholders within the organization so i think the great thing is that you know there's a little saying you know, if you want to go fast go alone if you want to go far go together and i think this is where from our perspective we know as a small organization Success has always been driven by collaboration and uh, it's our demonstration farmers, our members and those that we work with that really make that happen. So it is exciting times. Um, it is also challenging times. And I think, you know, I, I'm, I'm quite inspired by the fact that on that Slido um, that we put forward, you know, seven out of 70% uh, pretty well. So, well, there was a gearing towards uh, it's going to happen. And because, uh, and as, as Jonathan said, you know, this is not about it's going to happen, it has to happen. Mm -hmm. And I think the very fact that we have solutions and can drive those solutions is something that we really need to be taking forward. So uh, thank you. And uh, we hope many of you will be really excited to join on the journey in this space as well. Thank you. John. Thank you very much indeed, both uh, Philip and Caroline. That's really great. And we're going to get a quick uh, reaction from our expert panel on uh, on these uh, the, this, this strategy. Um, so, uh, Jonathan Wadsworth, what do you make of it? Well, I think it's really inspiring. I think it's a fantastic strategy, actually. Uh, I know how difficult it is to to uh, to write long term or ten year strategies for organisations, uh, but being aspirational, being ambitious giving yourself challenges, I think is really what's needed, especially in the area that, that LEAF is working in, uh, and at this time, absolutely necessary. Uh, I'm, I think it's a really optimistic and uh, ambitious approach. I, what, one thing which I really like about it, and this is obvious from where I come from, is that you're, trying, you're starting to take more, put more emphasis on, on global issues, and on the international connectivity of the food and agriculture system. Because no country is, is isolated these days in, term, in terms of its food and agriculture system. It's a global system. UK is one part of that, uh, and it's got its specific features of how it interacts with the rest of the world, but needs to be cognizant and understand what's happening elsewhere. So I think the linkages which LEAF is, is aiming to put in to be more of an international player, actually, and more connected to what's happening elsewhere is a really great move in the right direction. Uh, I would really hope that, uh, that you can find a way of expanding into those areas. I mean, there are, I, I know of uh, experiences both in Asia and Africa, which where other organizations are doing similar type of, of approaches to, to what you're doing, not necessarily at the farm level, but at the village level. Into, uh, there's a whole network of climate smart villages uh, throughout Asia and, and Africa through some of the organizations that I work with and it will be interesting to, to exchange views and experiences with people like that. I can, you can find them or I can put you in, in, in contact with them. I think on one of the points, I know that when we had a little pre-chat uh, yesterday, I was a bit critical about, I didn't see much of a flavor of where's the consumer in your strategy. You know, as I said earlier in, in, this, in, in, this, uh, in this conference, you know, everybody's a consumer and makes decisions three times a day if they're lucky enough to have three meals a day. And I'm sure you've got that in your strategy. It comes out through the educational part. And I'm really glad to see 
a, a holistic view of the food system where transformation is needed, but transformation at the consumer end of the way that people are educated, the way that they they have new diets and they prepare food. I mean, that's a generational thing as well. So starting with children and parents is, is, is a great idea, but it would be nice, I think, to see customers slightly more emphasized in the strategy. And final point, I know you want to get rid of me, Tom, and, and give chance to you, <laughs> Most strategies that I've been, uh, been used to developing, towards the end, we'll have a, a strategy piece on, so where is the money coming from? To yeah. what's our strategy for getting money to do this? Because resources are required. I'm not saying this is a, a critical element that you've suddenly got to write, but be aware I think personally, there's a huge potential for bringing in more resources. Uh, and you, you know, if you if you don't ask, you don't get. So maybe somewhere in your strategy, and you start start thinking, what are your goals? You know, and I mentioned in, in my video, Oxfam started small, but it now is massive, mm. and it's global. So you know, that's an aspiration. So I'll okay. hand it back, <laughs> back to Tom. How about a fat loan from the World Bank, or maybe even a gift? <laughs> well, I explained before. Yeah, unfortunately, you know, we tend to get <laughs> funding right there. Uh, we must move on. Uh, Chris Buss, your thoughts about the strategy? Yeah, thanks, and 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 thanks, Philip and Caroline, for that presentation. Um, inspiring, and and inspiring because uh, it's great to see nature and nature-based solutions up front and centre in your strategy. Um, for for many years, it's it's been a it's been a battle um, in the pure conservation context of the, the sort of the, the protection of, of nature, but also realizing the value of nature and putting it at the front and center. And Minette mentioned about soil biodiversity and so little is known about soil biodiversity um, and the critical role that it plays. Um, so it's great to see that and, and how we can, can build on that. And then also just, uh, just the, the, the role of farmers. And, and Caroline, you said this is a year of opportunity and it, and it's it's it is a year of opportunity, and it, it's it's very rewarding to see how the UK government is taking the role of farmers, not, not just in the UK but globally, um, as a driving mechanism into their discussions in COP, into the negotiations in COP26, um, and the role that, that farmers play as a, as a client as delivering climate solutions, and that is that is really exciting, and it, as just as exciting it is is to have nature and nature belief solutions as one of the five priorities for the UK government in COP26 and that that cannot be underestimated the value that plays and then and then the value that 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 brings to to farming systems so really exciting and, and thanks for the opportunity to be here and, and Chris just a quick comeback on that um do you believe that um COP26 and the UK being in the spotlight of global climate change ambitions this coming year do you think that the, the what the UK farming is doing in, in general and, and LEAF are doing in particular, there's an opportunity to kind of spread that word uh, across the world, briefly if you could. Yeah, I, th I think so. And that's, that's sort of the, the role and function that I play in both of, both of my jobs of, of spreading that. We work with, with organisations like the World Bank, Food and Agriculture Organisation, World Farmers Organisation. And there's a massive network out there to, to keep spreading this message. Yeah, as I said earlier, we do a lot of work on forest landscape restoration, whether that be agroforestry. That's on 75% of forest and farmland managed by farmers. And that's where we need to be spreading that message out to, to make sure that they're not marginalised, but integrated in decision-making processes. Thank you very much. I and mean, Minette, your, your thoughts about the strategy? Um, look, I'll be brief because we all had such a lecture from you yesterday and Jonathan, <laughs> but, but the safety of Washington is, is safer than the rest of us, I think. Um, look, I, I think it's a great strategy. Um, it's, it's sort of my privilege really to chair the farming organisations group, which is UK wide and has all farming organisations on it. And Caroline brings, you know, such depth of knowledge to this area. Uh, with her, the leadership that she has shown with LEAF. And, and we do need to spread all of this. You know, I, I think what we have to do now, the UK has been, I think, very, uh, you know, polarised in many ways in our approach. And we, we have to have a coming together. And, and I think that is already happening. And I think what we have done collectively on the future of the policy is very exciting, but also the global role. I'm picking up on what Chris said, you know, I am a, a trustee of Farm Africa um, and I'm also part with the NFU of the World Farmers Organization. 
and it's amazing how farmers across the world, you know, the African farmers in particular that I work closely with, we have a phone now. If you have, if you have a phone, you have access to technology, as long as you have, bizarrely, when I was in Zambia, they have much better connectivity than we do here, but that's a whole nother story. But, you know, we have got the mechanisms now to, to spread these messages and to deliver the changes. And, and I think that does make what I said at the beginning, this being the decade of farmers. And it's not just about food. We haven't had the chance today to really touch on the fibers that we produce. You know, look at a wool market that has just fallen, imploded globally. You know, wool is devalued by 50% across the world. You know, that is, that is criminal in its very form because, you know, there is such an opportunity to be working with natural products for insulation, the opportunities for producing latex with milkweed, all of those things. We've got to grow things on the earth rather than keep taking it out of the inner earth. And, and that is our opportunity. The more we can spread the leaf message, the more everybody can take ownership of it, the better. So I applaud uh, Caroline and Philip for the leadership that they continue to show in this area. Thank you very much, Minette. Uh, uh, Duncan, briefly, if you would, uh, I think you'll given your relief uh, demonstration farm, you're not going to disagree with much in the strategy. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I thank, thank you very much, Tom. I will be brief. And congratulations, Caroline and Philip. Um, when I first joined LEAF right at the start, it was very much a farmer-based, industry-based. It kicked well above its weight. Did some great things, but I always found the term integrated farm management a bit clunky and not consumer-friendly. And to hear, Caroline, in your narrative, talking about partnerships and health and society and nature-based and circular economy. You've really brought it up to date. So I think a fantastic job. And I, I want one of those new colourful multi-faceted um, <laughs> IFA. So, no, I think you've, you've always, as a, 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 a cause, done the right thing and had a, made a great effect. Others over the years have taken a lot of the LEAF principles and made them their own. And I think now today you are... You guess you're, you're taking back control, and I know Jonathan said it wasn't that consumer friendly or consumer orientated, but Jonathan, this is a vast improvement, and I think if you're going to get 50 demonstration schools, good luck because that that is a huge target, and if you can do that, and as an industry, you know, with the likes of the NFU all working together in partnership, getting Open Farm Sunday and 50 demonstration schools and leaf demonstration farms you know we've got to be onto a good thing so well done and hopefully that's not too long tom perfect thank you um i, I just want to raise a, a topic that cuts across um something a lot of people have raised on slido it's something that speaks to food security it speaks to leaf and it speaks to climate change which is should we be uh, how can we push to get more horticulture more fruit and veg grown in this country also of course matters for our our own uh, healthy plate uh, Minette, this is presumably something that you, you would you would push heavily, and, and I'd like either um, Philip or Caroline to come in on this as well. But mm. Minette first. Um, Tom, look, it's, it's absolutely essential that we produce far more of our fruit and veg here, not least because we are putting, as a nation, you know, 70 million people, very densely populated country, we are putting enormous pressures on water scarce parts of the world. So we look at our sourcing from Chile, from Spain um fr from many parts of africa it's it's there is a moral imperative to be producing more of our fruit and veg here because we have the climate to do it we have the most extraordinary situation with water at the moment where abstraction in the east is getting more and more difficult and on the western side you know with climate change the challenges of ever changing um, more extreme weather events means that you know we've got a lot of water diffuse water that is just disappearing out into the sea. So we've got to be able to move water in the first instance. We need to be able to move water. We need Tricky to, to do low carbon, that. Sorry? Tricky to move water low carbon. It's heavy stuff. <laughs> you look at our history, Tom. I think we've shown very good ways that we can move water um, and we need to do it. And, you know, ultimately we've, we've got to be able to make better use of our resources in this country. So. The other thing I just mentioned quickly, because it's such a live subject for growers, is this is going to be transitional. You know, a seasonal workforce is absolutely fundamental to the, to the bridges that we need to build to automation. So how we harvest our crops, too, and the investment in automation is, is going to be key. But, you know, this is about this is 
to Jonathan's point, you know, every single person needs this a minimum of three times a day. Luckily enough, if they if they can afford to have three meals a day. So we've got to be able to invest in the future and growing more fruit and veg here is, is I, I think, completely fundamental to the future of this country. One thing that every single person, regardless of their age, needs to eat more of is fruit and vegetables. So why would we not be doing it here? Um, but there are those other critical elements, water, labour, investment in automation that all need to happen in a synchronised manner. You look at the investment in other countries like Holland, which has been a long term, massive investor. Um, we are going to have to incentivize that change with our growers here. Don't forget, they are 24 percent of farm gate value. They are the most progressive sector. Um, and the efficiencies that they have returned back to farm, keeping fruit and vegetables the same price, don't forget, as they were 20 years ago, it's been the most phenomenal and unrecognised success story. Thank you. Uh, Philip or Caroline, would you like to, to come on? Yeah, can I, can I just start? Actually, I'm, I'm pretty well involved in the vegetable production uh, every week of the year. So um, I have experience of where the, you know, the current structure of business is. And one of our issues, Tom, is that um, today we, we, what we face is a really low margin business. Veg production is incredibly consolidated in the UK. And it's because the cost of entry is high, the supply chain is complex, and our customers want it as cheap as possible. You know, we, we talked about waste earlier. And when you actually look at our veg packing plants, and we're probably only packing at best 60% of the carrots we bring into the plant, probably only 40% of the parsnips. You know, that is because our, our customers want perfect produce at a low price. So actually, yes, we should be producing more, but actually we'll need a, a whole change in the way that our, our, our food chain is structured from where it is today. That, that's my concern. Caroline, did you want to come in? Yeah, and I think it feeds into the conversation earlier as well, where this is, it's not just about the farmers creating solutions, it has to be the whole food chain right. that is about delivering change. So as, as us as consumers asking more where our food comes from, eating food, i.e., you know, stuff that looks like food rather than 54% of UK food that we eat is ultra processed. That doesn't represent or look like or contain the ingredients of the wonderful things that farmers would have grown. So in addition to that, yeah, yes, we need to eat more vegetables. So it does have to be that drive. And of course, you know, it's very much part of our key ambition is to engage consumers in this space. So they recognize the value of connecting with their food, not only from a health perspective of what you're eating, but actually the whole cultural bit. And I think this is one thing that COVID-19, because we've done all this time without mentioning it, uh, has actually managed to sort of highlight is how important food is, how important nature is. Thank you very much indeed uh, for that, Caroline. Um, something that uh, has, has come up uh, not less than I expected, actually, and I just wanted to give uh, both uh, maybe Caroline and Minette a chance on this. Just briefly, um, certainly in the uh, National Farmers Union's 2040 net zero ambitions, the generation of energy on farms is significant in that, isn't it? And I, and I, and I think you want to see to see more of that. Should we be seeing uh, basically uh, more more wind turbines on land and uh, more solar panels on our farms? Get a minute first, and then maybe Caroline. Look, definitely. It's very much part of the government thinking. Of course, um, renewable energy is sat in, in a different department. Um, so we've got to be careful that we don't we don't conflate the two. You know, they are they have been two separate things with, with different drivers behind them. But, you know, this is a fundamental pillar of delivering on net zero, the bioeconomy, renewable energy, um, being able to incentivize um, electric vehicles on farm is, is a key part of this as well. You know, we are not going to be able to continue in a world that is just focused on on uh, on diesel. You know, we how about an end to red diesel then, Manette? Should we be taking that uh, subsidy for, for fossil fuels away from you? Well, you want to keep affordable food, don't you, Tom? And, and you know, the red diesel exemption has kept food affordable and that's been the main driver behind it. But as we step into a new world, we've got to start different incentives so you know you've got incentives for electric vehicles that are, you know for cars for people you've got to have those 
incentives for electric vehicles on farm. And you've always got to be focused on this food affordability point of view. I mean, if I look at the different dynamics between the farm bill and where we are, we are going to have to take, you know, a very considered approach to investment of public monies for public goods. But EVs on farm is, is definitely a route that, that we need to go down. Thank you. I, I, Caroline, I think I'm right. I'm just trying to look at your wheel behind you, the, the leaf wheel. It does have a turbine on there, I think, doesn't it, that I, I'm trying yeah, to make out. I mean, how important is um, uh, low carbon energy generation to the leaf story? I, I don't hear a great deal about it. Maybe you think it goes on anyway. Yeah, I mean, 63% of our leaf mark growers will have one or two more of renewable energies on their on their farm. So that in itself is, is indication that, yes, it is there. And, and Duncan certainly mentioned it as well. Uh, in places like where we farm down in Cornwall, there isn't enough sort of there's not enough stuff uh, space left at the moment within the, the national grid for us to plug in more energy. So we, the infrastructure is not there. So that does need to be addressed. But I think just picking up on Manette's comment, you know, we do need electric tractors. And uh, with the, the sort of the fast tracking of no diesel or petrol cars by 2030, wow, you know, this is where the, the race is on for innovation and technology to have uh, non-diesel use tractors. Uh, and, and the more, you know, we can actually create solutions to not dig fossil fuels out of the ground, the better it's going to be. And that's going to be for our fertilizer and going back to some of the comments that Duncan was picking up on. And also for, um, uh, for using less um, concrete or limestone for concrete. And I was really excited to hear uh, something from Exeter University the other day where they were using miscanthus as a potential, as an alternative to concrete. So mis miscrete, I think it was called. So there's the, this is where the real space is for innovation and technology. Well, thank you very much. We're, we're, we are kind of drawing to a close a little bit on the, on the conference here. And there were a, a couple of things that really um, stood out to me that were, were I mean, amongst many that, that really that pushed through. I mean, uh, I think, Minette, I'm not misquoting you to say you, you thought agri uh, agricultural policy, a good agricultural policy could be delivered, in effect, through the prism of climate friendly farming. That could be the guiding principle for a good agricultural policy for the UK. Can I just check I've, I've understood that correctly? Yeah. That's a big deal for the NFU to say that. Absolutely, um, Tom, but to all the points I've made that it is it is good for the business too, because, you know, I, I think the misconception lies around what I class as two pretty ghastly words that don't sum up what is needed. But, you know, we focus on productivity and we focus on efficiencies. Now, both of those, you know, tend to have farmers and everybody else, NGOs saying, oh, you just want to produce more. The number of times the NFU has been challenged on productivity you just want to produce more it's just not about that and what does sum it up is is climate smart farming which is about you know less input more output it's about farming and that's what we've got to get back to is sustainable farming this is what leaf stands behind at, at all times so i do think that we can deliver the bulk of the vast proportion of um public monies for public goods uh, in the ambition to deliver carbon neutral food um, because it's good for the business, good for the planet and good for our food system. Um, just while I have a look at some of the other highlights that have been pulled out by the organisers of LEAF, could we, could we bring up the result of the, um, the Slido poll, if you could name one issue uh, COP26 should tackle what it would be. Is it possible to sort of scroll down that at the same time, Sam, to give people a, a feel of what's there slowly so people can read it? <laughs>
I think these these answers are coming in as fast as we're scrolling and <laughs> scrolling down. Uh, so <laughs> it, it'll all be there uh, for people to, uh, to 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 look at in the in the future. Um, that's great. Well, an, an amazing uh, an amazing list of suggestions there, and I, I should just say a particularly engaged and long list of questions for this conference that I had, and I, I can only apologise to uh, the delegates that I was only able to get through a tiny fraction of them. And also, just while I'm on that, I'm, I'm aware that some of my colleagues from the the press were out there, and I was maybe my own inadequacy. Forgive me. I was unable to distinguish your uh, questions from other people's. So. If there are particular questions, I'm sure through LEAF, uh, we can find a way of you getting those questions to the people that were on the, that, that, that were our delegates uh, today, because uh, I know there are some fascinating things there, and certainly there are plenty of things that I could have had to write up. Um, I'm just going to whip through really quickly some of the things that have been pulled out as, as uh, highlights from the discussion here. Um, uh, Chris Buss was saying it's very important to get the whole farming system in our calculations, not just look at one part of it, kind of whole uh, life journey there, and um, the, the opportunities for investment in this area, particularly in soil carbon. Um, uh, Minette too was talking about the importance of a reliable uh, carbon calculator for farmers, saying that the NFU has one. It needs to be international, our approach, there's no point offshoring any uh, uh, negative uh, outcomes for the climate. Um, and uh, just moving on to uh, uh, agroforestry, now saying that the farm, farmers are the friend of the tree uh, these days. Um, uh, we also heard about how um, a third of agricultural emissions uh, overall could be resumed, uh, could be, excuse me, uh, removed if we got tackled waste. Uh, consumers are the biggest force for changing things in the marketplace, whether we should have uh, carbon uh, labeling on, on products as well um, uh, and uh, Chris Walsworth uh, po pointed out that farmers can recoup part of their climate impact through smart practices in fact it was it was said very clearly I think by John in his video excuse me John Walsworth that um, farming really has an opportunity which is presented to really no other industry that it can be go beyond becoming carbon neutral to actually becoming a massive solution to this car, this climate crisis we have. And I think that is so incredibly important and, and something we should all absolutely cherish. I'm just gonna finish on a question uh, or a statement that came from uh, one uh, gentleman, forgive me, I, I've forgotten the name, who basically says, when can we meet in person? It's much better to be doing that. And I'd just like to say here, here, here to that, three cheers to that thought. <laughs> Let's get together for uh, next year and a final uh, Slido question. How would you rate today's annual conference? Uh, so if you want to answer that, uh, be my guest. In the meantime, thank you very much to uh, our guests who are here. Uh, Minette Batters, uh, Duncan Farrington, Chris Buss and uh, John Wadsworth. And of course, to Philip uh, and uh, Caroline. But most of all, um, to you uh, lot out there, the, the delegates who came along to this conference. And uh, I hope you all gained something out of it. And I hope you will go away inspired for the following year. And uh, let's meet again and, and press the flesh in a year's time. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great day.